Um, so today we are interviewing our Uncle Eric, and before we have him on the screen, we're going to kick it off with a little pre-roll video for the drama. Yes, all oh, the drama. <laughs> Livermore Valley has been known as the Livermore Valley since, um, you know, 1835, Robert Livermore. You know, grapes first started coming here really in any serious amount with the gold rush, and then by the 1880s, people were coming here from San Francisco as weekend locations. The Livermore Valley of the 1950s was a much slower place than it is today. When I was born, there was about 5,000 people in the city of Livermore. And today, what's there's 80 some thousand. In terms of the wine business, really in the early 1990s, it got down to there were four wineries in the valley. And today it's over 50, due in large part to being able to get the South Valley plan together which is a agreement amongst all the parties in the area about how to do zoning and how to maintain open space and how to allow agriculture to continue. The Livermore Valley today, I think, is a very vibrant and dynamic area. If you look at the increasing quality of wines coming out of Livermore Valley, I think the Livermore Valley is really living up to its original impact in the wine business in California. So I think that we're going to continue to see better quality wines. The Livermore Valley is really a pretty magic place for growing grapes. Cool. <laughs> Well, thanks for watching our video, and we're super excited to welcome our Uncle Eric, Wente family cowboy, to Wine Wednesday. <laughs> Hi. Official title. Well, good afternoon, and good to see you all in such good form. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for that amazing video. It's very motivational. It is. Makes me want to ride horses. My buddy Eric. Hello, Wentes. Hi, Samuel. Um, so, um, we're so excited to have Eric on today. Eric is our dad's older brother. So probably, you know, kicked him around probably a little bit. I would have to imagine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, never. Um, and so we thought it would be super fun to have Eric come on. Eric has a love for history like our dad, uh, a love for wine, a love for Chardonnay. Uh, we have his Chardonnay here, and that's what we are drinking, drinking tonight. So, yeah, cheers to you cheers. all. And to Eric, thank you for joining us. Um, cheers, Adrian. I see you coming through on Facebook there. Mm -hmm. um, so, and he also has a love for horses, as you guys saw in the yeah. video. Uh, and the so many beautiful, beautiful, beautiful horses have been seen on our property from my childhood up. And I think a lot of that comes from that cowboy spirit that um, Ali mentioned earlier with our family, the, our cowboy uncle Eric. Well, probably, probably it would have been your great grandfather, Ernest, who would have been the one who really started with the um, cattle ranching. And I think that he probably, given his brothers might've rather had a big ranch someplace run cattle than uh, perhaps be in the wine and grape business. But oh, he, he Ernest, never. Wait, so mm. Ernest was with the Longhorn cattle, is that correct? Well, Shorthorn cattle. Shorthorn. Okay. Yes. Right. Longhorn. So, anyway, yeah. <laughs> what, whatever it is that the, uh, I mean, the whole horse thing starts with, if you go back to great, great grandfather, uh, my uh, great grandfather, Carl, who started the winery, um, then everything was horsepower. Okay. And so <clears throat> you had from November through March where you really didn't need horses. And so what you wanted to have was property to turn the horses onto in order to let them graze all winter at the lowest possible price. So a lot of what's now what we call the cattle company in the family was originally grazing land <clears throat> intended to, for the horse population, the draft horse population to run all the farming operations. And then during the spring, summer, 
and through harvest you kept the horses in barns and that's the barns that still remain over at uh, I would say Uncle Phil, you would say Father Phil's house, the barns that are still at the winery and the barns that were across the street that just came down were all part of the uh, keeping horses during the, uh, the, the farming operation. You kept them and you had to feed them every day. So you had the combination of the grazing land for the uh, non-productive time in the vineyard. And then you had more land that you needed to cut hay on in order to be able to have enough hay to feed the horses during the uh, working time. So you needed quite a bit of property because it wasn't gas pumps and diesel fuel, it was hay to feed the horses. So quite a bit right. of land was required just to farm the vineyard. You needed twice as much land as vineyard just about in order to make it work. That's so amazing because I never knew that that's where our like horse and cattle kind of came from. I never knew that, never even asked, but well, I do mm -hmm. love to ride. Yeah. So Eric, what do you think about the new kind of a trend, I would say almost, of bringing horses back into the vineyards to run plows and all of that? Um, when I was in Burgundy uh, in November, uh, they had horses in some of the vineyards. So um, I think that that could be, if you can get enough money for each bottle of wine, that's wonderful. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think that, uh, and then also understanding that, so if they're back to the traditional, I've got a bunch of open space for when I'm not using the horses and I've got a bunch of space where I'm farming hay without <clears throat> too many inputs to it. And so I'm cutting the hay with the horse and, uh, and a cutter and I'm not using diesel tractors, you might get there. But otherwise, by the time you get done with the footprint, it might be more just face value rather than the actual overall um, in right. the overall uh, environmental footprint. Or what about compaction in the soil? So <laughs> <laughs> often enough, that's about the size of a horse's hoof. Yeah. So when you've got 12 to 1500 pounds, if you're using draft animals, 1500 pounds, and you put two of those on the ground and two more than two more, um, you can get a, a low pressure tire and diesel tractor and do as well. Um, I think yeah. our farming, our farming in, in now where we're using the over the row machines, we're putting the compression of the wheels of the over the row machines in the center of the row, not next to the vine. Old style of running tractors, you're running the wheels next to the root zones, so then that's pack, pack, pack. But if you run in the middle and or you run ATVs that have got the very light pressure on them, then you have no compaction. So I would suggest that probably um, on a compaction basis, the over the road combination with the ATVs might be a more effective activity than running large draft horses. <laughs> so there's a question though from Suzanne that do you know how many horses did it require to run the farm back in the day? The I mean, maybe, is, I think, maybe a bit like a per acre or, or something. I mean, I, I would guess that it had to be 24. 24? Right. right. Because by the time you break them down into teams um, and you have, if you, if you look through all of the information that Phil developed, the amount of acreage going along and you start figuring out single horse or, or two horses in a team, um, there was a lot of acreage to cover and you aren't covering the same amount of acreage as you would today with uh, our current operation. So I don't, I don't have a clear answer, but just looking at the barn sizes and everything, my guess is it's around 2024. 20, the, the amount yeah. of, when we were kids, the amount of uh, old uh, draft horse stuff my grandfather threw out, um, there must have been at least a dozen or more uh, collars there. And I imagine that they had to be someplace else. So best answer. <laughs> That's a great answer. So what was it, you know, like growing up in Livermore um, with your family who are farmers and showing you the ways of the land? What was your experience like? Well, um, I mean, as opposed to the to today where I think 
kids are basically overscheduled. And we got <laughs> off the school bus and walked home. We were there until we walked down to the school bus again the next day. And it wasn't really till just about high school that we were doing very much in the way of, you know, you have afternoon lessons, you go to your soccer practice, you go, you go, you go. It wasn't like that. And, um, you know, we could play between our house and what's now Phil's house, Ernest's house. You know, we, we'd start to walk over there and uh, each side. So our mother and our grandmother knew that we were coming, but we might take two hours. <laughs> and we'd stop and play with the horses. We'd catch the horses with pieces of string, climb on them off of a fence, ride around, go over there, get off. What? Stuff, yeah. Stuff, stuff that my... today, today um, you, you know, parents would be arrested for letting their kids do this. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was just fine then. I mean, and you just went out and, and started. We're going over to grandmother's house, and you walk over, and then if you were lucky, you talked your way into a ride back. Otherwise, you had to walk back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but, man. Well, you do the walk but, a lot. Yeah. The, uh, I mean, the changes, the changes um, going along from uh, moving irrigation pipe for, for farming to getting into the um, overhead sprinklers to now into the drip irrigation and actually the canal coming through, the South Valley Canal coming through, we didn't really have a strong irrigation potential for all the property until the mid sixties. So we were dependent on a well at Phil's house and we were dependent on two wells down on East Avenue. And so our farming was really much more limited because we couldn't get, we dry farm some stuff, but otherwise you had a limit on what you could farm based on the water. And when the aqueduct came through, we had water to cover all of the property. And then now as we've gone to drip irrigation, we've actually kept reducing our per acre usage. So that's allowed us to expand our total acreage even more on the current water deal. So I mean, that's been some of the stuff that's been a big impact to uh, being able to stay as high quality uh, growers in Livermore. So when uh, when we were able to have the canal come through, so obviously we didn't really plan that ourselves. But was your was your dad a part of that? Was Carl number three? Well, Carl three. <laughs> when the canal came through, by and large, it's a, a state um, activity. And after they've surveyed every place they're going, uh, or options they kind of come and tell you where they're going. So we're okay. going right through here. And then you say, can you move it a little bit? Because, you know, the first drawing is right through Phil's house. So let's move it this way a little bit. Let's go around a little bit. And, but basically they ran it the way they wanted. We were able to negotiate to have what we call turnouts. So we, we were able to negotiate to have turnouts that were located strategically for our properties. And then we were able to negotiate to have contracts for water delivery um, with the local water agency zone seven so that then that put us in the position of now being able to plant more acreage to be able to farm more competitively and and now today as we've gone to the narrower uh vineyard rows you know we've basically more than doubled our vine count and um the production per vine is actually more but it's higher quality because of the way we farm so there's yeah. been a huge amount of uh, huge amount of progress from the old cordon or originally the uh, just single vine no trellis you know the candelabra uh, vine and so you know it's it's been a huge huge progress there uh, to where we are today. Wow. So switching gears a little, there was a comment that came through about Gray Riesling. And I know that you were a big, you were a part of the winemaking team, right? When Gray Riesling started, or were you already the CEO at that point? No. So Gray Riesling um, has been around, you know, since the uh, beginning of uh, basically of grape growing in California. And then uh, great grandfather Carl didn't like it. So he pulled it out 
then grandfather oh. Ernest decided he liked it, so he put it back. And, <laughs> um, up through the 50s, you know, things were smaller, growing more slowly. Late 60s, early 70s, all of a sudden there's this big boom in interest in demand for consumption of good quality wine from California. And great mm -hmm. recently, um, it's, it's unfortunate that the name got changed, but uh, Grey Riesling was a very drinkable wine and people loved it. And it was in basically every restaurant in San Francisco, for example. Um, mm -hmm. And then the uh, name got changed to Trousseau Gris. And at that point, we decided marketing Trousseau Gris was going to be way too difficult. So we <laughs> discontinued it when the use up point was uh, done. Um, so I don't know, except for where you find some odd vines left in the vineyard, we don't have an organized planting of Grey Riesling at this point, to my knowledge. But it's a Great. wonderful <laughs> Yeah, you never know. <laughs> yeah, you never know. I might make a comeback. Um, and yeah, so we, we used to sell a lot of Grey Riesling, and it was very popular. A lot of people from the started drinking wine in the 50s and 60s will say till this day that's the wine they grew up drinking or that their parents grew up drinking. And you know, the other one that we had was the Blanc de Blanc, which was a Chenin Blanc based wine. And the amount of Chenin Blanc sold today in California is not very much. The amount of Grey Riesling sold today in California is effectively none. So mm -hmm. Chenin Blanc, I would say, is having a comeback. Well, yeah, one there's the, lots like, of Trevi Chenin Blanc, yeah. Trebbiano. Yeah, it's, it's having a comeback well, for sure. And we had Trebbiano also, uh, Uni Blanc. And that was yeah. part of the with the Chenin Blanc. That was part of the blend in our in our right. Chenin Blanc program. Um, so, Eric, can you take everyone on a journey of like kind of what your career path was at Wente oh. and like where you know like where your where you were really playing um, a big role for the company? <laughs> so, um, career path. Um, Eric, Philip, and Carolyn, all of us basically grew up as I say, living on the land uh, more so, I think, than today's uh, lifestyle of kids would be. So we all had lots of different experiences, you know, starting at 10 years old, um, working on um, various projects uh, with, with our grandfather to learn how to drive tractor, learn how to drive grain trucks. So by 13, 14 years old, I could drive most of the equipment that we had and, and um, so just kept working in the vineyard uh, all the way through college basically. I never worked inside until I got to college and actually my first inside job was keeping books for, I was the bookkeeper for almost a year um, while I was going to school at Davis plus in the interim between um, and so I learned how to keep books and then uh, started into the winery side of things after getting out of uh, Davis uh, with a went to Stanford and had a got a bachelor's degree in chemistry then Davis and got a master's in in winemaking and then started back in the winery uh, for about three years and then uh, dad died and so at that point um, it got to be everybody on deck to figure out how to run this thing and so um, Grandfather Ernest got Eric, Philip, and Carolyn together and said, so do you guys still want to be in the business? And so we said, yes. He said, good. He said, that's what I'd want too. So he said, then he called Bank of America was our um, <clears throat> lender at the time. And Bank of America, Ernie's, grand, Ernie's uh, brother, great uncle Carl, had been the president of Bank of America. So Ernie knew most of the older executives there. And so he Bye. called up and said, he got one of the senior vice presidents out with a couple of guys with him and had him come out and the it's the office isn't there anymore. The building's there, but the particular office isn't. But so I'm sitting the big desk, Ernie's behind the desk. I'm sitting sort of next to him and there's three chairs in front. The guys come in. Hello. How are you guys? How are you? How are you? And they sit down and he said, well, I'm glad you came out. And um, so I had a talk with the kids and they want to continue. And that's good with me. So I just want to make sure that you guys understand that that's good and that's okay with you. Yes, sir, it is. Yes, sir, it is. Yes, sir, it is. And then he stands up and says, well, thank you for the meeting. It's good to see you. 
<laughs> and that was it. So these guys drove out for about a 10 minute meeting um, and effectively were told that they were going to continue to be our lender. Um, that was old style banking. Today, it's not like that anymore. But um, at the time, I'm yeah. kind of sitting here amazed that I just got tried to keep my mouth, you know, from being too. <laughs> yeah, as you know, this meeting only lasted 10 minutes. There was an executive vice president of the bank and two of the senior vice presidents. And he just said, OK, you know, this is what we plan. This is what we want to do. Is that OK? Yes, sir. Thank you, boys. Good to see you. How old Oh, the question from the sidelines here, how old was I? I was, uh, at, at that point, I was 25. Wow. Big shoes to fill at the age of five. Yeah. So from 25, um, and so take what's another 28 years on 25. So then I was probably a president or CEO during that period of time and then moved on so that there's more opportunity for everybody else. And by and large, in the vineyard, while we were kids, we probably had every job known to yeah. whoever, um, from big and ditch to changing pipe to driving tractor to, and then we also, all three of us worked for uh, the cattle company on Sundays. So Ernie could come over on Sunday morning and bang on the screen door and say, let's go, I've got a job today. And so then off we went. What a, yeah. what a different life. So I just want to say that um, the other day I did drive a D8 because Raphael let me do it. So Rhonda Wood, I did rip your land just a little bit, just for like five minutes. <laughs> Purposely, on purpose. Um, ripping the land means you're turning the soil, basically, um, get, doing a yeah. really deep turn. And um, one last thing, I just want to shout out to all of my vineyard team who watches this because I love you guys, Augustine specifically. I know you're watching and you've been asking me to say hi. <laughs> um, so uh, a question came in on the Instagram. Well, first of all, um, uh, Maya wants to know if you will make a Grey Riesling again. We we don't know. Um, but another, another one. From What's your vote, Eric? Great wrestling um, again. Well, in the current environment, if we can just sell what we have in front of us and be successful, I'd say that's a you know keep your eye on the ball. And then in the long in the longer term, it could be fun you know to have two, right. three, five acres, and so five acres you know thirty tons, let's say, then sixty cases to the ton. That'd be 2,000 cases, you know, that it could be fun to have something to play with. But I think we got enough on our plate at the moment that I wouldn't anticipate an immediate comeback. <laughs> um, Julia wants to know what your favorite job in the vineyard was. Picking up rocks. <laughs> well, <laughs> picking up rocks was sort of, you know, that that's about like getting a sentence to uh, uh, pardon <laughs> him. <laughs> Um, it happened, so, right? You guys had to go pick up rocks and put them into a yeah. wagon. Sometimes you had to pick up rocks. Sometimes you had to change the the, uh, the sprinklers. For a lot of it, wound up being fill in where they needed somebody for specific stuff because the regular guys did the regular jobs. But then it's okay. So I want to rip some ground, or I want this moved, or something else. And then the, the vineyard manager at the time, Cecil uh, Gary. Um, by the time I was about 16, would want me to drive tractor as much as I possibly could while his regular drivers took summer vacation in front of harvest. And so he'd look at how was he going to get everything done and where was he going to find a, you know, fill on tractor driver. And so I became, I think, basically one of the fill on tractor drivers that then the other guys got their two weeks vacation or whatever it was and were back in time for harvest. So I did a lot of tractor driving. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, we got a question here. Um, and one before that one, mm -hmm. uh, Mary is asking if our wine is available in Houston, and it sure is. It absolutely is, Mary. So if you um, send us a private message, we can help you find it closest to you, and then we can answer the question on the screen, maybe. Oh, okay. yes. Um, how did Wenty have to change and adapt to success through several ge generations and still operate successfully nowadays? Good luck. <laughs> That's a big one. <laughs> well, 
I think first of all, the you know the the concept of being a family owned and operated multi generational winery is sort of like job one. So that I've always had that in the front of my mind that how do we manage ourselves so that we will be able to continue to be a family owned and operated winery for multiple generations. Um, then at the risk of being a little bit, um, I don't know, trolling, I guess, um, it's getting harder and harder between the rules and regulations, the laws, everything with the state and federal government who tend not to be your partner and your friend and in, in staying in business that a lot of planning has to go on for um, estate management, how you pass things along, how you're able to actually have the next generation have an opportunity to continue in business. So that's probably where I've spent a lot of time over the last 10, 15 years is just how do we get so that we're going to be able to have the next generation without um, having some catastrophe that would, would not allow it. So behind the scenes, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes that goes on in order to be able to uh, successfully operate. Then in the front of the scenes, we have a very good team. We have great winemaking. We've got good marketing. We've got uh, a lot of our own vineyard that that uh, that yeah. makes the wine. So here's here's the vineyard. Here's the marketing. Um, and so on, on the front side, this is what you need to be competitive. So. There we are. Yeah. Um, so there is another question on the screen, but first I feel like we have to talk a little bit about what we're drinking because Eric, we are drinking a wine with your name on it. So you want to tell us a little bit about the inspiration behind this wine? Why is it having your name sure. on it? <laughs> I think that it was that it was it was Phil and Carl that were talking one day that to have a winemaking contest amongst the winemakers um, with Chardonnay and that everybody could make something like a hundred cases. So a ton, ton and a half of grapes and you could have the grapes farmed however you wanted. You could use whatever barrels, whatever, everything that you wanted. And so then my recipe was basically a minimalist um, that, okay, I want the grapes at 23, 22 to 23 bricks at harvest. I don't want higher level. Fermented in stainless steel at around 55 until it's dry. Rack it off, keep it in stainless, bottle it in March, and then be ready to start shipping it um, thereafter. So here we are, um, the 1st of May, and this bottle that I have, at least the one on my end of the screen, is a 2019 Chardonnay. So, you know, it's this, the style I like is, uh, you know, the, the basic fruit forward Chardonnay character when it's young. I like the acidity. I like the, uh, the clean finish to it. And um, so here we are. And then when we started selling the 100 case lots in the tasting room, it turned out that there was a fair demand for the Eric style. And I think they originally set out to call it some other name that I didn't remember, but I didn't like it. And <laughs> so then they, then they named it Eric's and I didn't know they named it Eric's until it came out on the bottle. So that's what they do. That's what they, but it was yours. It was yours. Um, yes. so I think this is exactly what I wanted to, uh, exactly mm -hmm. the style that I like. If you keep this, I have, I have from the first vintage. So I've got like maybe a, uh, what now, 10 year, uh, 15 year, maybe uh, range of wines, and it's doing very well. Gets a little bit older, it starts to have some uh, almost like oak character to it, and it gets to be uh, very fun. Well, um, I think this will be our final question. So, thanks to everyone who's been watching, and Kimberly, thank you so much for your fun question for Eric. So um, given all your roles that you've played, what is one of your proudest moment, moments on behalf of um, your company? Oh, and really quick before you answer that, I just want to point out that um, if 
P.F. Chang's is offering to go and when you can get Eric's to go from P.F. Chang's. We see a comment in here reminding us and thank you. That's very true. So sorry. What's your proudest moment? Well, maybe right now. <laughs> We're still in business. And so now from 1883 to 2020, you know, so that's 137 years and we're still here and it looks like we're going to be able to continue for the foreseeable future. So, you know, given, given my view of what we want to be doing, I'd say today is the day. I'm proud we're here. I'm proud we're doing this. I'm proud of the company. I'm proud of all the people that uh, work with us, work for us, everything. And, and that's, you know, we're doing what we should be doing. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's, that's an awesome way to end answer. it. <laughs> and I, honestly, to just echo that, I'm, I'm so proud to be a part of the Wenty team that we have, because when we say our Wenty family, we really do mean the entire team that works with us. Um, we are in the trenches every day with the, the team and, and we love them. And then we also think of our, our Wenty following as our family as well. So everyone that tuned in today, um, to watch this, uh, everyone that, that buys our wine, everyone that sells our wine, everyone that has it in their restaurants, you guys really are a part of our family and the reason we're here today. And the reason that today is Eric's proudest moment, which is super, super cool is because of everyone here. So thank you guys so much for all of your support. I mean, what are we going to do without you? We, we couldn't do it, you know? And, and so you really are a part of our family. Yeah. And Cheers, um, Eric, yeah, I cheers out of one. I, I have been caught filling it up twice. <laughs> <laughs> cheers to that. Cheers to you guys. Cheers, Eric. Ching, ching. Um, thank you all for joining. And Eric, thank you for um, hopping on. And we hope everyone has a really great rest of their week. Stay healthy, stay safe, be happy. Yeah. And, and if you want Eric back, send us questions to ask him because we will be here yeah, for a while. If we continue pestering We him. have more time to ask the questions. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, and everyone have a great evening. Thanks, okay. Eric. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. The Livermore Valley has been known as the Livermore Valley since, um, you know, 1835, Robert Livermore. You know, grapes first started coming here really in any serious amount with the gold rush, and then by the 1880s, people were coming here from San Francisco as weekend locations. The Livermore Valley of the 1950s was a much slower place than it is today. When I was born, there was about 5,000 people in the city of Livermore. And today, what's there's 80 some thousand. In terms of the wine business, really in the early 1990s, it got down to there were four wineries in the valley. And today it's over 50, due in large part to being able to get the South Valley plan together which is a agreement amongst all the parties in the area about how to do zoning and how to maintain open space and how to allow agriculture to continue. The Livermore Valley today, I think, is a very vibrant and dynamic area. If you look at the increasing quality of wines coming out of Livermore Valley, I think the Livermore Valley is really living up to its original impact in the wine business in California. So I think that we're going to continue to see better quality wines. The Livermore Valley is really a pretty magic place for growing grapes.